Thanks, Amy. After that song, I say, well, let we just say amen and go home. Pretty well got the message summarized, doesn't it? Or maybe it's just a good prelude to hearing from God's word. So, well, we have a thing called a toast. Here's to you. <laughs> toast is what we do to honor somebody, right? To uh, talk about their admirable qualities. And we have a number of weddings here, you know, so we have a toast to the new couple and so forth. And so it's a statement of honor. It's a statement of giving a, uh, admiration to in some special way. Uh, and it's a special thing, especially if it's truthful. Well, it depends what they say. Now, if someone offer a toast to you and speak with truthful, what would you like them to say? Would you like them to say, here's to you, the chronic complainer. <laughs> oh. Well, the shoe fits, wear it, but... Uh, that's not really the kind of a toast that you'd like to hear, right? You hope that would not be true. Another kind of a toast might be, here's to you, a perpetual, perpetually grateful person. Oh, that'd be a good, I'd like to hear that. Hope that would be true. Here's to you, a perpetually forever grateful person. Or what if he said, here's to you, the ultimate grumbler. Now, we've known people like that, right? Kids used to sing a song called Grumble Box, Grumble Box, you know. A grumble Box. And some just grumble. They complain about everything. They grumble. Not a good toast. Or here's another one. Here's to you. A reservoir of op optimism. <laughs> Seeing the bright side of things. That'd be, yeah, there are people like that. And they kind of lift you up, don't they? Or here's another one. Here's to you, the ever-reliable gossip. I've known some of those. Not the kind of a toast you'd like to have. The last one I like here is to you, a great encourager. You're a great Barnabas in my life and the lives of others. Those are possible toasts to people. As we read a little book in the New Testament called the book of Philemon, the first seven verses are a toast to to a man named Philemon. And a little bit about this book, because it's a, it's a very, very personal book, emotionally charged with an appeal for a particular person. It's written by the Apostle Paul, a person, to a slave owner named Philemon about a runaway slave named Onesimus. So those are the three major characters in this little letter. And you think about all the things that God wants to communicate to us and what he's been pleased to preserve in the scriptures why this letter? Why a letter, a personal letter, I mean, man to man, Paul to finally about another man who was a slave? What is going on here? And we'll got unfold this in the next couple of weeks and see the story. But it's a very powerful story. It's a book that models about getting involved in the lives of others in a personal and sacrificial manner. What is being asked of Philemon in this book is huge, as we'll see next week. But we want to see it's intensely personal about a very important thing to the people involved. And we'll also see in the next couple of weeks the importance of forgiveness in this book. So if you have your little sheet in your bulletin, I hope you have it. And someone said, oh, it's a two-sided thing. Does that mean the message is twice as long? Perhaps. Uh, we'll see. Okay. Uh, the text is in the, past, in the notes there. And it would be far better that every single person would come to the church with their Bibles open and to read for them. But sometimes people forget or just don't do that or didn't have one with them. But So it's in the text here. But we want to read it from the scriptures, Philemon, verses 1 through 7. And uh, just note this letter. And so the first seven verses are really like a, it's a, um, a toast to Philemon. Listen carefully. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus. And by the way, when Paul wrote this, he was incarcerated in Rome. He was actually a Roman prisoner, but he did not view life that way. He saw himself as being captivated and captured by Christ. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother. To Philemon, our beloved brother and fellow worker, and to Aphia, our sister, and to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always for you making mention of you in my prayers, 
because I hear of your love and of your faith which you have towards the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints. And I pray, I pray that the fellowship of your faith may become effective through the knowledge of every good thing which is in you for Christ's sake. For I, Paul, have come to have much joy and comfort in your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. So, Father, we thank you for giving us this revelation. And we pray for ears to hear and hearts understand the message that you are trying to communicate to us. And we pray, as Tom prayed earlier, that we not simply hear the words of the text, but let them integrate to our heart and be lived out in our lives. Father, speak to us today through your spirit, we pray. Help the one who speaks and those who hear to get it right. In Christ's name, amen. So if we look at this letter that Paul writes, the first seven verses, a toast to Philemon. We want to know at the beginning five things that Paul toasted or honored or valued about his friend Philemon. Remember, this is being sent uh, many hundreds of miles, and so it's a long-distance communication. But notice he says, first of all, I, I thank you, Philemon, because you are a beloved brother. If you have a little, your notes there, and I hope you take the notes to help you remember better. A toast to Philemon. Philemon, you are a beloved brother. <laughs> you know, it's something when somebody that you esteem as significant and important, like the Apostle Paul, would have this kind of a greeting to you, is it not? He said, no. Philemon, I consider you my beloved brother. And on a minute, we'll unpack what's kind of involved in being a beloved brother. So that's one toast. Philemon, my beloved brother. And Philemon goes on to say, my co, my fellow worker. <laughs> now, Philemon is just an ordinary kind of a man. Okay? He's, he's not like an apostle or he, he's just, he, he, he has a home, he has a family and has a job. And he's, but here, Paul says, I look to you as my fellow worker. We're in this thing together, brother Philemon. And here's to you, beloved brother, fellow worker. He lifts up Philemon and says, I, I thank you, Philemon, because of, your, of your, uh, your love for the saints. Your love for the saints and for your faith in Christ Jesus. You're a man who demonstrates and manifests and shows love. And your life, Philemon, demonstrates trust in Christ Jesus. And the last thing he rejoices in is that, you know, and, and, and Philemon, your life, your faith, your love are refreshing the brethren. And I'm refreshed. I have joy and delight when I hear about you and being refreshed by you. And so we want to take a little bit of time to work through some questions if on the back of your handout, five questions about this. If you want to look there, first question is, what makes one a beloved brother? I mean, what makes one a beloved brother? That's the question. So the first thing we want to observe here is this, is that a beloved brother in this context here is one who has the same heavenly father. The same heavenly father. I might have a story, you know, a friend of mine was in the military, and uh, he, was a, he was a private and he had observed one of his captains. And he had this, this feeling inside that this captain was also a Christian. Uh, and uh, so against all military protocol, one day he walks up to his ca captain. He says, sir, I think that we're related. And the captain says, uh, and son, how's that? <laughs> and then he says, he kind of, <clears throat> well, sir, I think we have the same heavenly father. <laughs> Good thing he was right. <laughs> and the captain said, yes, son, I'm sure we do, and shook hands. And, you know, that's a statement there, of having the same heavenly Father through Jesus Christ our Lord. God created all mankind, but in this sense here, this is not about just the created beings. This is about people who are part of the spiritual family, people who have trusted in Jesus Christ and have the same heavenly Father. We're related this is true for us. True for Philemon, as a follower of Christ. If you're a follower of Christ, we're in this together. We are beloved brethren 
and sisters together. So one mark of that is the same heavenly Father. A second mark is this, is a shared love for the Lord. Not just being a part, but having a, a profound, deep, penetrating love for the Lord. That's a part of being a beloved brother. There, there are people maybe that are churchgoers or uh, people maybe professing Christians, but, but you don't always sense that there's this, this passion to love the Lord. I just love the Lord. A few a couple of years ago, I was in a, uh, one of our spiritual formation institute classes, and, and this lady was sharing, and she said, you know, uh, I, I met Jesus Christ. She said, and I just, I just fell in love with him. And I just keep loving him more and more. And that statement, there was some kind of, a, of an authenticity and, a, and a, a depth of that that was just captivating to my heart. I, I just fell in love with Jesus. It's interesting about uh, people that you love. Uh, when you have someone that you love, you find ways or create ways to tell people about that person, right? That's what naturally love does. You don't hide it. And so part of this here is there was an overtness. I love the Lord. Beloved brother, same heavenly father. Beloved brother, sharing uh, a shared love for the Lord. And, and thirdly, a mutual caring for one another. That's a part of the brotherhood, right? A mutual caring for one another. That's a part of being beloved brother. See, sometimes there's people in the family of God who don't really seem to care one way or the other about you or anybody else. But a beloved brother is one who says, yeah, I do care for you. And we're going to see in this letter to Philemon, caring enough to be involved in a personal and sacrificial manner. We believe that, well, we know that Paul had actually introduced Philemon to the Lord. They had a close relationship, and uh, there was a mutual caring one for another. They're friends, if you will. True, wonderful, spiritual friends. Kindred spirit would be another way to put that. And there are people that we get to meet in the course of life. We meet them, like, you know, my heart identifies with your heart. Somehow there's, a, there's a, a special connection because of the same heavenly Father. We have a, a shared love for the Christ, for Christ, and we have a mutual caring one for another. So he toasts Philemon. Philemon, my beloved brother, <laughs> with our same heavenly Father and our same love for the Lord and our same caring one for another. That's what makes part of a, being a, a beloved brother. But then he's at the next phrase. He said, what is a fellow worker? That's a fellow worker. And uh, we look at this passage here. Paul, a prisoner of Christ, to Philemon, our beloved brother, and fellow worker, co-worker. What is a fellow worker? Well, a couple things we might think about here. One, it's, it's one expending energy for the same cause. Uh, the word work in Greek is a, uh, the derivative of our, our word energy comes from this. So expending the same energy in serving of the, of the Lord, the same cause. And as a, as a body of believers in Christ, we are called to exert effort for the cause and the purpose of Jesus Christ. It's not, not passivity. Passivity is not our spiritual friend. Being at peace is different than being passive. Jesus Christ was not passive. He initiated coming to earth. He initiated contacts with people. He initiated going to the cross. God is proactive. And if we are godly, we are proactive. Not just sitting, waiting, doing nothing. But being instantly available to him. And to be working together. Every single person, man and woman, who says they belong to Jesus Christ should understand they're involved in a ministry. They are a co-laborer. Here is the Apostle Paul, the one that is planting churches and being used of God to write these letters. I mean, he, he's a big name in Christianity. But he looks at Philemon, who lived in a local area, who was not noted as a, you know, as, as a missionary, an apostle, whatever. He says, you are my fellow worker. We are in this thing together, and we're expending energy for the same cause 
to further the cause of Christ. That's the driving force of a true church. Secondly, it's working, acting, and doing with and for each other. That's the fellow worker, co-worker, not just a you're doing your thing and I'm doing my thing, but we're involved in a common cause together, working, doing, and acting with each other and for each other because part of serving Christ is serving one another. They always go together. So Paul says, Philemon, here's a toast to you. You're my beloved brother, and you're my fellow worker. And I'm grateful for that. But then he goes on the passage, as you read there, and he said, I- I'm praying for you. And he said, I-, I hear, I hear about your love, what you have for all the saints. How, how, <laughs> question here is, I'm sorry, I'm getting to myself. Faith, first of all. I hear about your faith. What does faith in Christ look like? I mean, one is tempted to, to think about that. Well, you know, faith is, is uh, no one here. We should, we're way behind the slides. No, we're not. Faith, there it is. What does faith look like? I mean, I'm hearing about your faith. Well, hmm. well isn't faith kind of, a, of, a, of an internal thing that you kind of believe inside? Have faith in your heart, and you know it's, it's kind of a private thing. Is that what faith is? But Paul says, "I'm hearing about your faith." What well, can 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 you hear what's in the faith in my heart? And well, it's kind of a hard thing. Maybe faith is more than just something we have inside of you. As we see here that. That faith is, is um, it's active, explicit obedience. Active, explicit obedience. Remember the faith chapter, Hebrews 11? Uh, goes the whole thing about faith, what it does. And you have, you know, Abraham and Noah and Moses and all those people. It says, by faith, by faith, by faith. And in all those cases, by faith, what happened? Well, they had a revelation from God. Take Noah, for example. One day God spoke and says, <clears throat> Noah, it's going to be a flood. I want you to build a boat. So Noah believed in his heart, and he dreamt about a boat. Hmm. Sailing across the sea. So. That was not Noah's faith. By faith, Noah being warned about God and commanded to build a boat, he built the boat. He expended energy. He was obedient, explicitly obedient, actively obedient to the revelation of God. So that's the kind of faith that is, that is heard about. Philemon was a man who really believed in, in Jesus Christ and believed what Christ represented and spoke about and talked about. And he believed enough that he did something with it, something tangible. (laughs) Um, Did you notice in the passage, as Paul sent the greetings, he said to uh, probably his his wife, Aphia, and to his probably his son, and to the church in your, what is it? House. Buildings like this did not exist until the third century. They always met in, in, the, in the houses. Now, Philemon must have known that, you know, it's good for the saints to come together. Don't forsake the assembly together as having a assembly. Come together. They didn't come to a building. They went to Philemon's house. Now, he may have had a big house. I don't know. But do you know what happens when a whole bunch of people come to your house week after week? It's no big deal, right? <laughs> Easy, you know. They just show up, you know. There's no, I mean, yeah, people come. There, there's no clean, everything like that. It's just, it's really easy. Just, they just all come and have a good time. Well, you know that's not true, right? You got a whole bunch of people coming to your house. You got to rearrange the furniture. I mean, there's a lot of stuff takes place when you have a group of people come to your house. I mean, Think about it. This is hospitality expanded. We don't know. Maybe it was 10 people, 15 people, 20 people. We don't know. 
We know around the world today, there's little house churches where 20, 30 people cram into a room, kind of have to back in and, or walk in and back out. They're so crowded. So it's, it's not easy. That's the point. And so he is going out of his way to make place for the people of God, other beloved brethren and sisters, and other co-workers to come together. See, his faith had expression. Maybe Philemon had read, be hospitable to one, invite people to your home. And he believed that was something God would have all of us to do, and he did it. That's a faith that is heard about. It's explicit obedience. The phrase is another way. We only really believe what moves us to action. We only really believe what moves us to action. That was just a kind of a passive thing. Last week, Jeremiah talked about receiving. Remember that? And you talked about a passive reception, Jeremiah. Like, well, I just kind of, you know, just kind of take it in. Or a receiving where you reach out and grab hold of it. It was kind of a passive faith. That, well, you know, I just believe in kind of my mind. There's this active faith, this real faith. James said this, listen, folks, you show me your faith without works. It's a challenge. But James said, I will show you my faith by my works. Not that we're saved by works. There's not faith plus works. But real faith and trust in God is demonstrated in active obedience. I'm doing whatever it is because I'm clear before God. God wants me to do this. That's, that's what faith is. That's the kind of a faith that is heard about. People talk about those things. And so we ask that question, what is faith that he toasts? Well, it's active, explicit obedience. So only what we really believe activates us to action. Then he talks about love right? What is this thing called love? What does that look like? How can love be heard about? Well, count the faith. The love is, uh, it, it, it's really intangible, okay? This kind of a love that Paul talks about here, it's a love that, that really that touches people in a tangible way. Powerful, isn't it? What does that mean, tangible? It means real, okay? You know, it's one thing to uh, and then, oh, I, I really love my neighbor. I think they're really nice people. I don't really know them, but I really love them. <laughs> no, that, that's just kind of a feeling. But real love is doing things. It is caring for them. It is being with them. It is loving them <laughs> in, in a very special way. This type of love that Paul mentions is a, is a, it's a volitional and sacrificial and intentional kind of a love. It's not just kind of happening. It is somebody who's pausing and pondering and thinking, I know, to love my neighbor as Christ loved me. That requires my doing something. And it's thinking through, I'm taking a choice. And maybe it's a sacrifice. Sacrifice of time or money or energy or whatever the case may be. And intentionally choosing to do that. So this man Philemon, he's not just kind of like sitting back and, ah, oh, you know, you have a dreamy faith, a dreamy love. He has a faith that's actively obedience. He has a love that is tangibly touching people in a way they can, can know it. And then he says, the last thing he talks about, the toast to Philemon was, you know, I mean, I have joy and delight in you, Paul writes, and uh, the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brethren. What does it mean? What brings deep inner refreshment to another person? It's probably the tangible expression of the love and the acts of faith. But what does it mean to be refreshed by somebody? What is it that refreshes? And I would suggest here that it's, it's actions and attitudes that touch the heart. That's the expression of the love. That brings a refreshment to people. <laughs> I put it another way here is that... Uh, Refreshment can come by providing rest stops in life. I remember very clearly a lady in the chapel in the Sudan. This is many, many years ago. Okay, the way she came and says, Pastor, 
It's a funny statement. She says, Pastor, let me worry for you this week. Let me worry for you this week. Whatever you're worried about, just, just say, well, you know, I'll take care of it for you. I will. <laughs> it's a strange expression. But it was, it was her way of saying, you got some heavy burdens here, and <laughs> let me carry them for you in some way in prayer and just thinking about it. It was a way of providing a, just a, a little place of encouragement, little rest stops of life. You know, <laughs> A lot of times we get involved in really heavy things. And uh, this application point can be very careful with this because it could be just the opposite of being a refreshment. But sometimes, you know, people are cooped up in the house, uh, they're either doing home care, whatever the case may be, and someone comes and says, hey, let's go shopping today. Now, now that would not be encouragement to me, by the way, okay? I'm and that, you know. But I know some of you, like, to go shopping would be like, yes, get out of the house. <laughs> Just go shopping. Maybe not even buy anything, you know. I, I don't understand that at all. But I know, I know it's the thing that can be a, a rest stop for somebody, okay? Let me do that. Or someone comes and say, you know, let me just be here for a while at this house. And, and you go out and have coffee or something or just go do something. Go take a walk in the park. That's a little rest stop of life. That's refreshing. Or just pausing to listen. It's being with the people. Whatever was going on in Philemon's life, we don't know the details, but he was doing something volitionally and actively that was causing refreshment in the hearts of other people. Maybe bringing words of encouragement. We're in a new, new era, in, at least in this part of the country, uh, we're, we're, we're in the process of putting Hallmark out of business. We have all kinds of card makers, right? It's not just something that people do to, because they enjoy making them. But you know what they do with those? They send those cards to people. And there's something, you get a card that was kind of personally designed for you. <laughs> that could be a refreshment. These are small little things. And so Philemon was doing things, volitionally out of love and faith for those people. And the hearts have been refreshed to you. And, 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 and Paul writes, I'm so excited by this. It gives me joy and comfort. I'm in prison hundreds of miles away. And I'm hearing about what you're doing for these other people. And I'm like, yes. Paul wrote in the letter, I really live hearing you stand firm in the faith. I really live when I hear you're going on and serving and loving Christ and his people. <laughs> wow. So that's the toast. That's those things. Now, at the same time, we're going to skip gears a little bit here, but what is Paul? What does Paul model in reverse? Remember, we are fellow workers together. He says, this is what you're doing, Philemon. <laughs> you're being a faithful, beloved brother, and you're a fellow worker, and you have faith in Christ, but I can see and love what I can hear, and you're refreshing people. And That's what you're doing, Philemon. Here's to you. <laughs> and Paul doesn't say, now here's to me, but he says three things that are a mutual ministry. Notice, notice these three things that, that Paul says that he models being a good brother to Philemon. You might kind of miss the first one here. In verse 3, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. One thing is he speaks God's blessing to dear old Philemon. Huh. Just words. It's never just words. Think of the negative impact that somebody has when they curse you. I mean, those words of cursing can penetrate the soul. When someone says, damn you, that can just grip the heart. That's the negative side. That's cursing. But Paul says just the opposite. Grace to you. Philemon, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus. Those are powerful words. And to hear those words, that's a blessing. Speaking words of grace and peace are a blessing. And so Paul is, actually the whole letter here, he's blessing Philemon in this toast to him. But speak words of blessings, words of kindness. The Lord be with you. When those words are heard, 
from someone who cares for us. Expression of God's work in our lives. The Lord be with you. That's blessing. So Paul models one, blessing, but also it says something else. I thank God, verse 4, always making mention of you in my prayers. Paul had persistent prayer, petitioning prayer for Philemon. Now, here's the deal. Paul is incarcerated in Rome. Maybe not in a prison cell, but maybe house confinement. But he's not free to go where he wants to go. He may well have been bound to a Roman soldier. He is not staying in the Hilton Inn. He doesn't have a lot of the amenities of life. It's a time when Paul could have said, man, woe is me. Life is really tough. I've been beaten and shipwrecked, and now I'm in jail. And, uh, you know, he could have been so absorbed in himself because of his circumstances. But Paul says, no, I'm sitting in this jail cell, and I'm using this time. And I'm praying for you, Philemon. I pray for you, making mention of you in my, always making mention of you in my prayers. That even though he was in a hard situation, I'm praying for you, Philemon. <laughs> wow. How good it is to hear. Sometimes I'm praying for you. That would be a great encouragement to Daryl Philemon. And, and then he does something else. <laughs> you know, he says, uh, I, verse 7, I have come to have much joy and comfort in your love. The saints are refreshed. He has sincere affirmation. Philemon, I'm hearing about you, and it thrills my heart. You are doing a good thing. You are being a beloved brother and a fellow worker, and you are being a man of faith and a man of love, and, and you're being used to refresh the saints, and I thank God for you. <laughs> sincere affirmation. Doing a good job, Philemon. We used to get a letters back in the old days before emails and all that kind of stuff. Overseas, they had sent called airgrams, okay? And so they were real thin paper, and you, you fold them up and seal them, and so it was a cheap way to send international mail. We used to get a, a, a letter from one of my former profs at Dallas Seminary. Count of them, thank God for you. Love, Ron. That's a whole letter. Okay, we could live off that for weeks because it was it communicated his heart. That's what, that's what Philemon's doing here, or Paul's doing here. He's saying, Philemon, I thank God for you. <laughs> I can celebrate what God's doing in you and through you and for you, and I rejoice. I'm not so self centered that I can't do that. <laughs> no, I'm just rejoicing. I'm seeing the, the positive things you're doing, Philemon, and I'm celebrating. Sincere affirmation. Hey, here's a question for you. Which of these things could you do? Could you speak God's blessing to other people? Could you persistently, persistently, persisting prayer for them? Could you be an agent of affirmation? These are, these are incredibly simple but powerful and doable things. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And imitate, walking after him. These are things that, that Paul did. And you and I can do them. You don't need seminary education to do this stuff. This is stuff that children can do and grandparents can do and everyone can do. We can all speak blessings to people. We can all pray for each other. We can all affirm in other people if we get our eyes off ourselves. And the things that, that Philemon was doing, I mean, being a faithful brother, fellow worker, these are all things that are very doable for us. Well, someone says, why bother? Why bother? Again, you look in the passage, 
It has a little hint here. It says this. I hear of your faith and your love, which you have, about your faith, which is in you for, for in verse 6, for Christ. That's the motivation. Why bother? Why, why, why work at being a, a good, beloved brother, a good fellow worker, a good person of faith, a good person of love who refreshes me? Why bother? Me? For, for Christ's sake. For Christ has done for us. That's the motivation. No. Why would that not motivate someone? Well, for Christ's sake, that phrase should surely motivate someone who has placed their faith and trust in Christ and are believing in him. He's done for us. <laughs> the sacrifice he made. He lived and died for me. Why then should I not live for him? That's the motivation. The motivation. Well, we close. Here's the key, the text up here. And uh, here's the question. Uh, how is God speaking to you through this passage? Are you listening? How is God speaking to you? God is alive and present and speaking. And there is something he has for every single person in this room. And maybe he spoke through a song this morning, and through some portion of this passage. But if we're listening, we're going to be hearing God speaking. How is God speaking to you this morning? What thought is it that kind of keeps, you know, maybe about halfway through the message, you never went on with the presentation because you was caught by something that God is trying to say to you. That's what matters. Are you listening? When these doors open, exit of our church, there it is. And it opens, and you go out. What will you do, what you've heard? That's what it's all about. When Philemon walked out the doors, not of a church building, but he went out and acted on what he had heard. He was actively obedient, expressed in love for the brethren. It's easy to be in here and to hear songs sung, to sing, to hear a message, and maybe even say amen, you know, on the way. But that's, that's just being passive. Walk out those doors. We take Christ into the world. Are you listening to what God is saying to you this morning, what he's calling you to do? As you walk out those doors, what will you do with what you've heard? And next Sunday, could there be a toast to you? Here's to you, my sister, my brother. You heard God speak, and you did. Here's to you. That's what ought to happen. That's normal Christianity. Passive, doing nothing, is biblically abnormal Christianity. Healthy Christians are actively obedient. They're doing exactly the things that Paul toasted Philemon. They're being a beloved brother. They're being co-workers. They're walking in faith, explicit obedience. They're walking in love, volitional caring. They're being used to refresh one another. It's a great thing to be refreshed. This morning, I could uh, give you a couple examples. Met a man this past week. Sat for an hour and a half. And we talked because we're beloved brothers. And we're in this thing together. And I walked away with my heart being refreshed. That's the way it works. What are you hearing? What will you do? We're going to close by singing a song. They'll know we are Christians by our love. Not by just passive statements, but by active love for each other. Let's pray. God is speaking to you or trying to. Are you listening? 
And are you saying, yes, Lord? Yes, Lord, you have spoken to me this morning about affirming some people. You just spoke to me about being, taking a step of faith. Yes, Lord, be your response. Perhaps some of you here aren't a part of the beloved family. You've never come to faith and trust in Christ. And this morning you're realizing Christ is calling you. And you need to place your faith and trust in him. Do that. Respond. Pray, Lord Jesus Christ, I trust you as my Savior. For those who are part of the family, who are the same Heavenly Father, I know you just speak to us and help us to respond in obedience. So, Father, we are before you in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, empowered by your Spirit. And we pray this morning that as we leave this building, as we go out those doors into this world around about us, that we will do exactly what you've called us to do this morning, to be beloved brothers and fellow workers, men and women of faith and love who refresh others. That's our prayer. In Christ's name, amen.